Good evening. Uh, thank you for attending the community information meeting for the Cherry Creek West project. Um, to allow everyone a chance to get logged on, um, we're going to start in uh, two minutes. Um, so thank you for those who are on time, but we are expecting a few others, so we will give them um, two minutes for that. Thank you for uh, attending the community information meeting for Cherry Creek West. We're going to uh, start in one minute. Um, just give folks one more minute to log on and then we will get going. Okay, uh, we're going to get started now. So um, thank you for attending the community information meeting for Cher the Cherry Creek West project. I am Becky Zimmerman uh, with Design Workshop, and I will serve as the facilitator for this evening's meeting. Um, I'd first like to introduce you to Liz Torres with the Community Language Cooperative. Sarah, do you need to unmute Liz? Sorry about that. Hi, <laughs> my name is Liz Torres, and I am here with the Community Language Cooperative, and we are here to help create a space for language justice. What that means is that we want to create a space where everyone can participate and engage in the language of their heart or the language that they feel most comfortable in. We will use simultaneous interpretation to create this space. And when I finish saying this in Spanish, we will turn on interpretation and you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. If you are not fully bilingual, we ask that you select your language. If you are bilingual, feel free to listen to everyone in their language. When you select your preferred language, you can check to mute the original audio. In that way, you do not hear both languages at the same time. Hola, mi nombre es Liz Torres. Estoy aquí con la Cooperativa Comunitaria de Idiomas y estamos aquí para ayudar a crear un espacio de justicia del idioma. Lo que esto significa es que queremos crear un espacio donde todos podamos participar y comunicar en el idioma de su corazón o en el idioma en el que se sientan más cómodos. Usaremos una interpretación simultánea para crear este espacio. Cuando termine de decir esto en español, activaremos la interpretación y se verá como un icono de globo terráqueo que dice interpretación. Si no es completamente bilingüe, le pedimos que seleccione su idioma preferido. Si es bilingüe, no dude en escuchar a todos en su idioma. Cuando seleccione el idioma de su preferencia, puede hacer clic en silenciar el audio original para que no escuche los dos idiomas al mismo tiempo. I'm ready. Okay, that should be there. So uh, this meeting is required by the city's uh, large develop review process, um, and this meeting is being recorded. Um, we just have to put a few guidelines into how the meeting is run tonight. So any anybody who disrupts or delays or interferes with the meeting or you know makes is intimidating or uses obscenities will be muted and may be removed entirely from the meeting. So we all know how to behave in, in Zoom meetings, I'm sure. Um, when we get done with the presentations, we will uh, have the opportunity for questions and comments. 
um, we will, I will call you, will raise your hand um, and you'll see that uh, tool in your, at the bottom of your screen, or for some of you, it may be the top of your screen. So you raise your hand, we will call on you and we will uh, provide you the opportunity. We will unmute you and provide you the opportunity to talk. We will also uh, be taking questions through uh, Q&A. Uh, so uh, if you're not familiar with uh, how this works, um, as I mentioned, you will see uh, an opportunity to raise your hand um, or you also see the Q&A. So raise your hand will pop up and we will unmute you and um, Q&A, you can just type questions and we will be monitoring uh, the Q&A and answering questions as we are able. And we'll remind you all of this after we get done with the presentation. Thank you, Becky, for that. And I wanna thank everybody for coming to learn a little bit more about Cherry Creek West. Uh, my name is Amy Cara. I am the managing partner for East West Partners here in Denver. Creating a terrific place like Cherry Creek West uh, takes a village. And so we have several other people with us here today that I'm gonna um, share with you. Um, first, from my team at East West Partners, I have Mariel Bowden. Um, we also have members of our master planning team design workshop. You just met Becky, um, she's the CEO. And you'll also hear from Rob Berg, the president. We also have Gensler, who's doing a lot of the vertical planning for us, and that with us is John Gambrell, the co-managing director, as well as Alex Garrison, the design director. Our project management firm, Buildmark, is led by founding principal uh, Patty Anker, and she's here as well today. I also like to highlight that, um, and you'll learn more about this as you um, see our presentation today, this land is owned by the Buell Foundation, so they're obviously very important partners to us, um, as well as Taubman, our neighbors in the adjacent shopping center. In addition, we are honored to welcome our elected officials. Here today with us, we have Councilman Chris Hines. Um, he is District 10 um, and the district in, that this project uh, is located within. We also have Councilwoman Amanda Sawyer uh, from adjacent District 5. You'll also hear today from city representatives, including Deidre Ose and Brad Johnson with Community Planning and Development. And also hear from the city team are Liz Weigel from Planning, Paige Colton, Matt Farman, and Chris uh, Brinker with Dottie, and Stacey West with Denver Parks and Recreation. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Deirdre to talk a little bit about the process before we dive into Cherry Creek West. Unmuted. Thank you very much, Amy and Becky, um, for hosting this meeting and welcome to all the members of our community and our council members. We're honored to have you here as part of the large development review process community information meeting. Um, so I'll talk to you very quickly about what large development review is. It is a requirement in our code for any property that is five acres or larger. We assess it for impacts um, to the community and the surrounds as large sites generally have a disproportionate impact. Um, on you know, traffic and transportation and um, parks and open spaces. So we look at these very carefully. We pause to coordinate with multiple agencies in our city. We review the large development review, uh, large development that has been proposed in context of our adopted city plans and other policies and programs within the city that may apply. And we facilitate this community touch point. So this community information meeting is hosted by the applicant and the city is here to provide preliminary analysis of what we have found as part of our initial dialogue on this project as it was submitted um, at the end of 2021. Um, and we've been working with the applicant through a series of um, meetings to prepare for this community information meeting um, and to continue moving forward with the project. So the LDR process in general begins with a concept and we initiate a preliminary scope identifying some key findings, concerns, opportunities, strengths, um, possibilities for a project like this. And particularly for a site like this, it's very important for all of us to be involved and understand not only what the impacts are, but what the opportunities are. The next step of course um, 
is this community information meeting. In between though, after we developed the scope, we did determine based on the high level of need around urban design and what they what the developers already put together in you know very impressive project and effort, we wanted to continue that discussion. And so we did have some interim urban design analysis and review, and you'll hear a little bit about our conclusions on that today as well. At the end of the meeting, we expect the applicant will submit a large development framework or an application on which we will develop a framework. Um, and in that framework, we will identify the key next steps, the subsequent steps and project requirements associated with our findings. So we know already that in order for this site to, to develop, uh, they're likely looking at a rezoning. Um, there may be a development agreement associated with that, depending on our findings. And then, of course, an infrastructure master plan will be a very important and critical component to uh, implementing this plan. And with that, I will hand it back to the East West team for their presentation. Thank Great. you. Great. And Amy, before you chime in, um, I would just like to tell folks that we won't be um, acknowledging raised hands during the presentation. So if you do have a, a technical question, please type it into the Q&A and we will get that uh, answered for you to help you out. Great, thank you, Becky. <laughs> so I thought I'd start a little bit um, with who is East West Partners. Um, East West Partners uh, is a development firm that has been in business for almost 40 years. And some of the projects that we've developed um, in the time since we've been here in Denver, um, which has been about 23 years, is Riverfront Park, the residential neighborhood that's uh, adjacent to Commons Park in downtown Denver, as well as being co-master developers of Denver Union Station. Um, we worked really to think about both of these projects as more than just a collection of buildings, but a place. And it's, it's more about all of those pieces and how they come together that really ultimately um, drives the way we think, um, and we think we're bringing that to bear here in Cherry Creek West. So a little bit on the site. I think many of you, most of you, know exactly where we're thinking about it, but I think it's important to describe the boundaries um, because they may be less obvious. So the first is that it goes from University Boulevard over to Clayton Lane. Uh, Clayton Lane is actually a private drive here and is um, really the, one of the primary access points to the shopping center. The other dimension is from First Avenue all the way to the creek. And that um, connection, the fact that Cherry Creek North Drive, which is also a private drive and the other uh, primary entrance into the shopping center, that fact that that is part of our development site is really one of the great opportunities here as well um, because it creates some really unique things that we can do here with this site. I like to start a little bit with mission and values because it's the way that East West Partners thinks about developing when we create a place. So you can read what's in front of you here, but really one of the things that we do differently that I think is, um, is special about our development process is that we start by thinking about how people move through a space and then think about what that public realm should feel like. And then and only then do we set buildings into the site. This site, I didn't mention on that last one, but Deirdre um, did mention it is just over 12 and a half acres. Um, so it's a good size space and it's it got a really unique location. And so thinking about people movement is important. We can embrace the creek as a result and connect the, that to the existing community as well as connecting the community itself to that creek. In so doing, we can then create a terrific place to live and work. So a little bit about our values, and then I know you're anxious to see what it is that we're creating here. I mentioned a little bit about develop, designing for people first. Um, that really is the, the fundamental driving principle behind all of our thinking. But we also really wanna celebrate the outdoors. There's a great opportunity here. There's not a lot of um, publicly accessible green space in Cherry Creek, and we have an opportunity to create some of that and a great connection. And in so doing, creating the neighborhood's new front yard. By that, we mean a place that everyone feels welcome, everyone feels uh, like they can come and relax, um, and everyone feels like this is a part of their own community. 
Similarly, we're putting the creek back in Cherry Creek. You'll see more as you see the plan on why, why that's the case. You got a little bit of a piece of that by seeing that the site actually connects directly to the creek and to the bike path. Um, and we have a great opportunity to give everyone that great connection across to that um, and really make that a special um, place because it is in fact the namesake of the neighborhood. We're also neighbors for the long term. I mentioned that the Buell Foundation owns this property and we are ground leasing it. And it has taken us years to negotiate um, a way to work together that helps to meet their long term goals of having a long term partner with long term vision um, in order to have us create a terrific place here. That is also great because it means that we are people who've been here in the neighborhood and will continue to be here in the neighborhood for the long run. And therefore, we have a lot of the same things in mind that you all do. And then the last one on this slide is centered around wellness. It's a really important thing to us that our buildings are healthy, that our places are healthy, and that everything, whether it's the public realm, the opportunity to exercise, what happens with the buildings and how they're built and, and how they are uh, populated is centered around wellness. And then the last three, we're unapologetically sustainable. That's a core value for East West Partners and something that we really stand for. And this project is no different. Having that long term lens allows us to really think about sustainability and think about it in the way that you would think about a building that is going to exist for 50 to 100 years and not based on some kind of a short term uh, viewpoint. So a lot of things that we're considering that relate to the public realm as well as the buildings. Um, and we can't wait to really get some of that moving. In that way and others, we hope to be a role model. This is a picture of Riverfront Park. Um, that's, a, that's a place that we think has been a role model for other folks around the country and around the world. We hope that Cherry Creek West can be looked at the same way. And finally, where work isn't work. As we're all coming back after the pandemic, certainly there are places where people are not really excited to get back to work. And our hope is that by creating a place where people are excited to come to, we'll be able to create workplaces where people are excited to be. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rob Berg with Design Workshop, who will continue to outline the plan itself. Thank you, Amy. Um... I'm going to walk through the design and share a little bit about how we arrived at the plan you'll see this evening. Uh, one of the very first steps we did as a team is divide, uh, do a deep dive into these four plans that you see on the screen. We, we worked very hard to develop a design and a proposal that would achieve as many of the goals that are set forth in these plans um, as possible within our project. Some of the highlights that have been included in our plan, for instance, uh, the addition of an improved public realm through privately owned public spaces as found in the Cherry Creek area plan, or the design of public spaces that are flexible and benefit different users and daily activities throughout the year um, found in Blueprint Denver. Or probably the most significant thing that we've been talking about since the beginning of this project are the many sustainability and resiliency measures that we've planned for in the design of the site to conserve water, to in increase native ha habitat, and integrate stormwater into the built environment through the use of green infrastructure. So here's where we started. Um, when you begin a project of this magnitude, it's important for us first to consider the role that this project plays in the larger context of neighborhoods. This isn't just another infill de uh, development, adding a few residential uh, units or, or office square footage. We really have an opportunity here to add generational value to this community. And as we start to zoom in a little bit closer, um, you can really see the immediate context here and the value proposition even more clear. Uh, the magic of this site is expressed in so many different ways. Uh, first and foremost, it's the gateway component or it completes a gateway component to this uh, thriving, thriving and vibrant district. Um, it's obviously a, a direct connection to the Cherry Creek Shopping Center and the Cherry Creek North Mixed Use uh, District as well. Uh, but beyond those connections, we believe a project of this magnitude should um, provide a key element that's missing today. And Amy alluded to some of that. And for Cherry Creek, that's accessible and usable open space. And what a better place to provide this than along uh, one of Denver's greatest assets, which is Cherry Creek and the Cherry Creek Trail itself. So public realm and placemaking are two uh, terms that we've used 
over and over again uh, in the design of this place. And we use the term place making quite a bit. You'll hear it quite a bit throughout the presentation tonight. Seems like today everybody's looking for and is in search of these authentic experiences um, that you can only have in a true place. Creating a real place isn't easy. Um, I'm sure we can all point to projects uh, where we've been, where place, place making may be inauthentic or fabricated or just simply falls short. We like to say on our team that placemaking is, is not that leftover space where you just add twinkle lights and, and food trucks, um, but rather placemaking is intentional. Uh, it's grounded in authenticity of a place. It's shaped by really great buildings and form that, and a true understanding of what life is like at 30 feet and below. And what we mean by that is, is all the buildings are very important um, but the general public really experiences the first 30 feet or so of any, any given building. And so the care and the craft and the curation of that first 30 feet is so important. And, and as we get into more building development and Gensler uh, does some more work, uh, that'll be uh, paramount to uh, the placemaking aspect here. So when you begin a project with a focus and dedication to the public realm over all things, you're building a place with a soul. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. Once again, the magic of this site is the ability to provide something that currently doesn't exist, uh, accessible open space for the community. And when I say accessible, I'm talking about a true barrier-free connection to Cherry Creek and the Cherry Creek Trail. From the very beginning, this team has been devoted to finding a way to make this connection happen. We knew it wouldn't be easy and we knew that to make an inclusive place, a place that people would not only come to experience special events, but also uh, come and feel welcome and comfortable to hang out and linger, um, we'd have to do everything we could to physically connect to the creek. So if we start with that big bold idea um, of a physical connection to the creek, we knew that the next important step in creating quality public realm was to minimize or eliminate to whatever extent we could the, the conflicts between vehicles and pedestrians. And these conflicts create great barriers to pedestrian movement. And so simply, we made the decision uh, to design for people first and prioritize pedestrians over cars. So this is our plan. It's a people first place with a soul focused on that first 30 feet and physically connected to our number one asset, which is Cherry Creek and the Cherry Creek Trail. The next few slides I'm gonna walk you through, give you some of the key elements of the public realm. We're gonna talk about what it feels like to be in these spaces. And we'll walk through these as a series of sub-districts within the development. Each of these districts has uh, its own identity and character, but contribute to this great pedestrian prioritized place. So we'll start by examining the north end of the project along First Avenue. Here you'll find a series of different districts um, and we're gonna focus in on the confluence first. We, we refer to this area as a confluence because of the convergence of all of the pedestrian um, activity and traffic that's generated from Cherry Creek North, the shopping center um, to the east of us and along First Avenue. And ideally, they're coming across a, a newly improved intersection at First and Clayton. When you're in this space, you're surrounded by a Colorado native landscape uh, and some of these first breadcrumbs of this concept of trying to connect people to the creek. The confluence is the, uh, what we refer to as a compressive space. Um, it, it's compressed by two really great building edges. These edges are active and lively and invite you to stroll a little deeper into the project and they frame the view of the next space we're gonna talk about, which is Market Square. So here's what it feels like uh, to be in the confluence. This public plaza is full of natural beauty. Uh, it's connecting you to the creek and the front range. We're inspired by thinking of utilizing more natural green stormwater techniques and bioswales to tell the water story of the front range and clean the water as it falls on this site before delivering it to the creek. We're excited about uh, creating active ground floor uses on the two building edges here that spill out with their vibrancy and activity uh, directly into this place. 
and ultimately creating these eddy spaces where you can grab a grab a coffee and and linger a while while your kids play in the in the fountain. In, in Market Square, which is that next component that we're looking at here, it's all about activity and access to the green. This truly is the heart of the project. This is a place full of shade and natural beauty, enticing you to slow down and, and do some people watching or grab lunch on one of the many active uh, patios here. And the market is a place that is always changing depending on the season. And that will keep you coming back uh, time and time again to see what's, what's new and what's next. Oh, skipped one. So now for the Southern portion of the plan, uh, I'm gonna highlight a few elements of the green and the creek. Uh, back when we examined neighborhood context, it was clear to us that one of the main deficiencies within Cherry Creek today is really a place that you can spend a full day. Uh, some of the, you know, some place that isn't fully focused on a transaction, but a place to be with others from the neighborhood or the greater community. The green is that place. The green is this fle flexible area that can host concerts on a Saturday uh, and, place, and a place to bring a, a blanket or throw a Frisbee on a Sunday. Just south of the green is a public plaza we refer to as the creek. Um, as I spoke of earlier, connecting to the creek in a big and barrier-free way has always been a guiding principle of ours. We want to eliminate the vehicular pedestrian conflict in this area uh, to seamlessly knit these two assets together. We want to do this to further encourage uh, community safety and inclusivity, welcoming everyone into this project. And we envision this plaza as a wonderful place for people to enjoy the incredible views over the country club uh, of the mountains to the west. So this is what we imagine the green feels like. It's a new front yard for Cherry Creek, as Amy was mentioning. It's a place for people. And you can generally get a sense of the scale of the space that we're talking about here. This place can be a host for great summer concert series. It'll be activated with ground floor uses from office and residential buildings on the two edges. And it has the visual permeability uh, to connect it to other portions of the district and uh, the surrounding context uh, along University and First. Now, with regards to the landscape connection itself, um, there's usually quite a few questions here. I wanted to provide a little bit more detail on how we're proposing to do this. First, it's important to re reiterate that Cherry Creek Drive North is not a city street, but rather a private drive. And this private drive today serves the access to the shopping center, parking garage, and provides access for service and loading vehicles as well. We're proposing to lower this private drive uh, below uh, a flat, almost 200 foot wide landscape connection from the green to the edge of our property along Cherry Creek Trail. Cars can travel below this connection to either enter our garage or, or continue through to the parking uh, at the shopping center uh, parking garage. And this really allows pedestrians to flow freely and safely without the worry of vehicles. I've talked about active edges in the context of the ground floor use and vibrancy. Um, here is a diagram that identifies what we are currently thinking of. And while we haven't designed any of these buildings yet, um, we believe it's important uh, to the public realm planning uh, that we are that we think very carefully about where activity is and where it's not uh, to ensure that there's this continuity of experience for people. As it relates to parking, uh, we're currently planning on four points of entry into the below grade parking structure. Um, you can see those with the arrows here on the plan. The parking structure will likely be two levels below ground and can be accessed off of any one of the four um, adjacent streets or, or private drives. Uh, you can also see as indicated in those green circles uh, where we're proposing to bring people up from the garage in a number of different locations. Uh, throughout the development. We've been working very closely with the city over the last 
few months um, as they continue their work on Denver moves and have already incorporated some of the specific bike related uh, infrastructure within our plan. Specifically, if you look on Clayton Lane, we're proposing uh, to include a dedicated two way cycle track. This will eventually connect Cherry Creek Trail to uh, on the south to some further facilities on the north. One of the questions we usually get is if there aren't any internal roads uh, for cars, how do you plan on providing uh, emergency access? Uh, and one of the things I actually skipped over and I apologize, I'll, I'll cover now, we're actually uh, including uh, what we're calling a shared street, uh, which connects um, the auto court off of University Boulevard and the auto court off of Clayton Lane. Um, a shared street is just sort of a fancy way of saying uh, it's a street that's that's really designed for people first, uh, but can accommodate the occasional car traffic. Um, it also then allows us for uh, fire and emergency access as well, um, while also providing an opportunity for load in and load out of, of uh, some of the event um, uh, staging that may occur, whether it's a market or, or, or a concert or something like that. We're also designing all of, the, all of the pedestrian pathway systems to accommodate emergency access and that kind of load in, load out experience as well. So my last slide here um, identifies what we're thinking as related to potential building heights. Um, again, as I mentioned before, the team hasn't designed any of these buildings yet. Um, and so there's so much more work to be done uh, as it relates to that. This is more of a thought about how we can arrange the buildings in a way to pr preserve great Western views, uh, create that visual permeability of the site so that you can really see through the site from first and the development to the north all the way to Cherry Creek uh, North Drive or from University all the way through to Clayton Lane and vice versa. Um, uh, we understand that we have the uh, Cramner Park view plane restriction. And so all of these buildings would fall uh, below that restriction. Uh, and you can see that how we varied the heights of the buildings to reinforce the urban form and celebrate the views. Uh, you'll see that we haven't uniformly maxed out building heights across the entire development, but instead have an average building height of about 10 stories. So with that, I think I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Deidre and with the city and she's going to talk a little bit more from the city's perspective. Great. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And let's see if I can get it to play. Everyone seeing, seeing this? We are seeing your preview mode. Huh. Because I'm looking at play mode. Let me try again. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. All right, not sure. Does it look like play mode now or is it still preview mode? It's play mode for me. It's still in preview mode. We see the current slide and the next slide. Okay. Um, and we um, have the suggestion to go to display settings and hit the reverse display button. Display settings. See display settings Sorry, down at the, at the bottom of your frame there. I know you would think we'd have this covered, but um, we use Teams a lot and for, and I've, not had a problem like this before. So let me just see. Display settings. So down at that, yeah, down at the bar there. Yeah. To your, to your left. So. so. 
So go back to the presentation, uh, go back into presentation mode. Just as you did Hold on, before. I'm gonna go out here. And then when you get into presentation mode, there is a, um, in the screen that we're seeing, it's, there's a, a button that says display settings. There we go. And then swap presenter view and slide. Yes. Okay. Is that better? Uh, you need to need to share your screen. Okay, that's the problem is that when I do that, then I lose the share screen thing. So let me um, let me see if I could try to share for you, Deirdre. Well, let me see if I can if I can do this, and then we'll see if this works. So now the now, display now. settings up at the yep right, just to the right of that. I've got a bar on top of this. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not sure how this is happening. Yeah, Liz, do you want to try to share and then I'll just prompt you? Yep, I'll try. Thank you. No Thanks. problem. Very sorry, everyone. Are you seeing that? That's good. Yep, looks good. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, so we will talk to you a little bit about our preliminary analysis on the proposed development concept. We start with a high level of looking at our city adopted plans. And of course, here we're looking at Comprehensive Plan 2040, Blueprint Denver, the Cherry Creek Area Plan, and then of course, Den Denver Moves Cherry Creek, as Rob mentioned, is a plan that is underway and is a component of the Comprehensive Plan. Uh, Liz, next slide, please. So at the top of our plan guidance, we've got high level guidance around resilience and sustainability. Equity is one of the most critical components that we look at when we look at a large development, uh, particularly as I stated, there are disproportionate impacts of a large development on a site. Um, we also review, of course, using the large development review process, review design and context um, with our city adopted plans and policies. The other piece of our city adopted plans, of course, is physical land use guidance, um, including identifying future place types and centers um, and then, of course, multimodal transportation opportunities in terms of bike priority, pedestrian, and transit priority. So we'll go over a couple of those maps. Next slide, Liz. With equity analysis, um, what is equity? As a city, we advance equity by serving individuals, families, and communities in a manner that reduces or eliminates persistent institutional biases and barriers based on race, ability, gender, identity, and sexual orientation, age, and other factors. So when we use that in a large development review, these projects can improve equity in the surrounding area through providing access to open space, access to the mix of jobs and housing choices. Uh, when there are rezonings associated with that or LDR or both, that provides us an opportunity to understand how a project can improve or at least not increase exi existing inequities. Next slide, Liz. So there are three primary metrics that we look at. We look at improving access to opportunity, reducing vulnerability to displacement, and expanding housing and jobs diversity. These measure measurements range in area from parcel level to census tract or neighborhood data. And we come up with metrics. Next slide. So as an example of outcomes, um, we may have a project that uh, is going to provide on-site open space, and that amenity will help improve access to open space and also perhaps reduce childhood obesity. In many neighborhoods in Denver, that is a real issue that we want to solve. Um, on sites like this, perhaps, on-site affordable housing units will improve housing diversity. Next slide. So what does the equity analysis tell us for Cherry Creek? For access to opportunity, the site is within an average area that scores around 3.56 that means that there is above average access to opportunities such as parks and grocery stores and open space and as you heard rob explain opportunities to enhance already existing connections vulnerability to displacement the site is with an area that scores not vulnerable and this is primarily because uh, there is a pretty low range of incomes it's a pretty high income area with 
low, you know, low opportunity or concern for displacement. Um, that being said, the project should be designed to be equitable across a range of housing unit sizes and meeting a variety of incomes. A high impact housing compliance plan uh, in the form of a development agreement is likely indicated by your housing and stability team. With housing diversity, uh, that area scores as average on that metric and it has less diversity, diversity in housing cost with slightly less missing middle housing uh, other than in other parts of the city. So missing middle housing is housing that perhaps is beyond single family or townhomes, maybe row homes, but opportunities to diversify the types of uh, land uses that people are able to access. Under jobs diversity, the site is within an area that has a great proportion of retail jobs than this greater proportion of retail than the rest of the city. Lower in innovation jobs and of course in manufacturing. The proposed development does identify office as a primary component of that land use mix and providing provides a more diverse job mix. Additionally, the high proportion of retail jobs also indicates an opportunity for improvements on providing housing to serve individuals and families employed in the neighborhood across the income spectrum. Next slide. So now looking at the physical components of our adopted plan, starting with Blueprint Denver, the proposed concept meets the intent around urban intensity and density, and will continue to evolve with respect to connectivity that aligns with urban and regional centers. Next slide. The site is surrounded by opportunities for bike priority. I think we're all well aware of the Cherry Creek Trail and of course other connections through the neighborhood and along First Avenue. Um, First Avenue is an expected enhanced bike corridor in the future. And that I'm sure has come up in the uh, Denver Move study. Next slide. So you'll also notice with uh, pedestrian priority, Cherry Creek North, of course, and around the mall surrounds, it is identified as high pedestrian priority for multiple blocks around the site. And you can see where obvious connections would be. Rob also uh, talked about that and showed where those opportunities are for that, for the site. Um, the evolution of the site does call for continued uh, clear connections through the site to the greenway, both visual and physical. And then the last one is transit pri priority. And the First Avenue corridor is designated as a high capacity transit corridor. This is just an example of what a corridor like that would look like. Um, so of course, as this development evolves, it will take into opportunity into account the opportunity that is involved with increased access to transit. The Cherry Creek area plan obviously is very specific to this site. There is specific guidance for the shopping center part and then high level gu guidance around the plan to promote compact development patterns with highly connected street grid, retaining regular street sidewalk and block patterns, which offer a high degree of connectivity for pedestrians, bikes and vehicles, orienting buildings and entries toward the street using context sensitive setbacks and continuing the greenway to the north along the east side of University, which is a designated parkway. Specific to the shopping mall, we're looking for opportunities to improve the public realm through creation of new privately owned public spaces. At the edges of the shopping center, looking at portal locations informed by building entrances, the opposing street grid and pedestrian oriented perimeter development, to the extent possible providing physical and visual connections to soften the seams and edges between first and the greenway. And then as the west side of the shopping center redevelops, which is this site exactly, looking for opportunities to incorporate and embrace the greenway and creek into the design and provide active uses along the greenway's edge in a way that does not compromise the natural beauty of the creek. Next slide. So I am gonna turn it over to Brad, <laughs> Brad uh, Johnson from our staff who will look through the urban design analysis uh, and review that with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deirdre. Uh, yeah, and so the, these next set of slides are really focused on physical design. And so as we think about how we apply the policies that and plan guidance that Deirdre described to this site, we, we first kind of wanna think about what, what is important not only on this site, but what are the important elements that surround it that should be taken into account uh, in the design of Cherry Creek West site. And so first we just like to zoom out and look at the site in the context of its surroundings. 
Next slide. And the first thing that jumps out to us is uh, this critical public edge that is the Cherry Creek Greenway. One of the most, um, if not the most unique uh, elements of this site uh, and, and such an opportunity. Next slide. And then layering on other critical public edges like the key streets, public streets that surround the site and University Boulevard and First Avenue. Next slide. And looking beyond the Cherry Creek West side up into uh, Cherry Creek North and points east and looking at that kind of uh, consistent kind of gridded pattern of blocks and streets uh, that we see in those areas uh, to the north and east. Next slide. And thinking about those different elements I just described as, as kind of a network, uh, an integrated network uh, of public edges uh, and connections. Next slide. And then while we understand certainly that um, Clayton Lane is, is uh, privately owned and a private street, in many ways it already uh, acts as a critical public edge in providing a uh, super important connection from Cherry Creek North down to, uh, down to the Greenway. And we think that's only gonna be, become even more important as this development uh, comes online. Next. And we look at the urban form that surrounds this site and in particular along First Avenue uh, and Steel Street. And what we see are buildings uh, that are sited to kind of provide a physical framing uh, of those public streets. So they're sited fairly close uh, to the streets, uh, which provides a kind of pedestrian friendly uh, environment, even on a, on a, on a really uh, car heavy road, frankly. Um, and what you don't see up there in contrast is, you know, large parking lots right along the street and things like that. So you have this building frontage that really defines the character there. Next slide. And then you see that, that kind of urban main street character continuing uh, up into uh, Cherry Creek North with buildings lining uh, the public streets up there as well. Next slide. And then lastly, one of the key things we look at is look at all these intersection points and crossings and gateways that sort of connect you, provide an entry or sense of gateway uh, from the surrounding of this site uh, into the site, both the mall site and the Cherry Creek West site. So think of all these different elements that I've described and how should they or could they influence the design of Cherry Creek West. Next. And so in trying to apply the plan guidance and taking into consideration all those critical elements I just described, we tried to settle uh, along in our discussions with uh, the East-West team and, and numerous uh, city designers and, and uh, practitioners, a handful of critical uh, principles that we believe this site needs to achieve in order to uh, achieve consistency with our adopted plan guidance. And, at the top of the list is really that this site needs to be designed in a way that embraces the creek. And when we say embrace the creek, we're reading that policy language as embracing the creek, engaging the creek, and activating the creek in a way that expands along the entire southern edge uh, of this critical site. Secondly, we talked about how this site can share impacts on the interior. So when we say impacts, we're thinking about uh, auto-oriented spaces, entries to parking garages, um, tunnel grade separated uh, roads, and thinking about how those audio auto-oriented, car-oriented impacts could be shared and kind of dispersed across the site rather than um, collected along those critical public edges that I talked about. Thirdly, uh, to create quality public connections both at the exterior of the site and through the interior of the site, uh, both east, west, and north, south. And that means a few things, right? So part of it is, is getting from point A to point B. Part of it is getting to point A to point B in a quality urban environment. And part of it is designing, being really careful to, to design uh, these types of connections in a way that they feel public, they feel like they're inviting to everyone, uh, and anybody can go there whether you're a paying customer, uh, you're just out for a stroll or whatever your purpose might be. 
Uh, fourthly, to create a First Avenue street wall. So I talked about that, that critical urban form that we see along First Avenue and up in Cherry Creek North. And so we think that this site needs to do uh, place buildings in a way that responds and reacts to that prevailing pattern. And then finally, as we think about the future, uh, one, of, uh, one of the policies Deirdre pointed out was, was resiliency. So when we think about resilient design, what part of what that means is, is designing for the unknown. We don't know um, what the future holds with uh, the contextual areas around this site. And so we want to push uh, as we think about the design of this site and that it's designed in a way that anticipates things maybe not changing at all, whether it's the Whole Foods site or how the mall is configured um, to the other end of the spectrum that they change dramatically uh, and all points in between. Next slide. So taking those principles in the context of the site plan that Rob uh, walked through with you guys, starting with Embrace the Creek, we're excited about the idea of a, a clean connection via the landscape bridge uh, that, that Rob described um, to the Greenway uh, in terms of a connection. But at the same time, we do have some concerns about how well this design does embrace the creek. And, and when you look at the red areas next to the, on either side of the landscape bridge, those are areas where Cherry Creek North Drive is proposed to be tunneled below that bridge, meaning that they are grade separated from the creek side and from the, the development side, uh, which really creates a barrier, physical and visual barrier between this site and the creek and vice versa. Um, and to give you a sense of just the scale of the portion of that southern edge of the site that would be grade separated, we're talking about something in the area of just, just shy of a, a couple of football fields. And so that's a concern in, in terms of, of the barrier that might, might be created there. And uh, we want to think through with the applicant team if there are other options or other opportunities to embrace the creek in a more um, comprehensive way across the site. This concern is somewhat exacerbated by a couple of things. One is uh, the northern edge of the Greenway and the, the multi-use path that you guys, many of you have probably experienced is very constrained at this location. And by tunneling a Cherry Creek North or Cherry Creek Drive North there, we, we are concerned that that will basically cement that constrained condition in place along the edge of the Greenway and not really provide an opportunity for that creek and Greenway to breathe. And stepping back from that just a little bit, we look at what our comprehens comprehensive plans say about uh, resiliency and sustainability and planning work that's going on around the city related to waterways and drainages. And we are moving in a direction as a city, generally speaking, where we're trying to push heavy infrastructure away from our waterways uh, rather than having it located uh, in immediately adjacent to it. So that's, that's something we'll want to continue to explore. Next slide. So I talked about sharing the impacts um, of the development on the site's interior. So I talked enough about, about the, the tunneled component of Cherry Creek Drive North, but I did want to touch on these uh, auto kind of auto court cul-de-sac elements that you see kind of boxed around in red uh, on the northern half of the site. So uh, these are uh, kind of drop-off areas, turnaround areas, and also provide um, access to below-grade parking. Uh, so we are a little bit concerned about the scale of them, um, where they're located along those public edges that I've talked about, and, and thinking about is there a way that, that those auto-oriented impacts could be more dispersed and distributed along different elements and around different elements of this site or different parts of the site. Next slide. Now just, just to give you a sense of, of what that space might feel like, it'll be different. Um, certainly East West will put their own spin on that, but to think about what an auto court or an auto kind of cul-de-sac like that might feel like, um, you could look to points East here, right? Like the, the sort of uh, turnaround space that, that sits in front Kona Grill uh, on the mall property, that might be something like this, these spaces might feel like. And so, um, we're excited. We, we understand that um, we, we want to push for uh, great public quality connections at the exterior and interior, as I described. 
Uh, we think this project's doing a really pretty great job of that right now, um, particularly along a University Boulevard and along Clayton Lane. Those are those are really public feeling straightaway connections. We do have um, some current concerns and want to think um, more deeply about how those uh, connections happen on the interior of the site and how those auto courts that I described might interrupt that feel and maybe make uh, those connections feel a little less public. Uh, and, and the way that they're shaped on this site right now and this concept might feel a little bit circuitous uh, and not, not quite as open and, and welcoming and feel like a place that anybody can go. So we wanna continue to work through that as well. Next slide. So I talked about that First Avenue street wall, and we've been working with the East West team on this one um, for a while as well. And the design has kind of uh, evolved over, over that time. And we think that uh, their team has done a really great job of responding to this goal uh, in creating that First Avenue street wall. And that it provides um, a fair, fairly consistent building edge, which is that pedestrian character and that kind of main street character uh, that we want, want to look for and build from uh, the, the context uh, to the north, but kind of does it in its own way. It provides a little bit of variation in a building form, but still provides a fairly consistent edge. So it can kind of be of its own place um, while still being consistent with context. Next slide. And then finally, we talk about, again, anticipating potential nearby change. And, there's no specific design solution we have in mind to explore here, but we just want to make sure that we're being really intentional um, as we think about whatever the ultimate design is for the for the Cherry Creek West site, and that it doesn't preclude potential clean and clear and optimal integration uh, with evolving things that might happen, may or may not happen, uh, on sites that are adjacent to this site. Next slide. And then I'll just end on this process slide. Uh, Deirdre showed you this a little bit before. We're sitting here at this uh, com community information meeting and we're looking ahead to a framework document which uh, Deirdre described earlier. Uh, and, and beyond that framework document, there will be many more uh, elements that we'll have to work through, one of which would be uh, potentially and, and likely a rezoning of the site, which would certainly require a city council approval. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, Deirdre. Really appreciate um, not just your time um, it, today for the meeting, um, but all the time that you and your team have been spending with us um, over the course of the last several months. Um, before we kick into some of the questions with raised hands and so on, um, and uh, actually we do not have, uh, we have a blank, uh, blank, slide up there right now. Um, but before we get into any of the raised hands, um, we do have um, several questions in the Q&A and I wanted to go ahead and start diving into answering some of them because they actually cover a pretty uh, good diversity of things that we did not uh, necessarily cover um, in our presentation today. The first question has to do with, um, you know, what's really, and actually there were a series of these questions that had to do with traffic and how people are gonna get around and so on and so forth. So uh, the first question from Michael Hughes related to the former circulator that had existed. Um, I can't go fully into the all of the things that are happening with Denver Moves Cherry Creek right now, um, but there's a lot of conversations that, that's happening right at exactly the same time that we're doing our pre-development for Cherry Creek West um, around the Denver Moves Cherry Creek. And that's a, a specified effort by the city um, to really think about all of the different transportation modalities, how things can be improved around the Cherry Creek neighborhood. Um, things like circulators are certainly you know, part of the conversation, both in that public conversation, as well as certainly in some of the private conversations we've been having um, just within our team, but also with our partners to the north um, and, and others um, about how we might improve that. So certainly not a dead concept for the future and uh, maybe that comes, comes together. Um, yes, this is a, um, and this is um, just sort of moving through this. There's a question from Sandy. Um, you know, this is a dense site, um, but we referred um, both in our presentation as well as in the city's um, presentation to the fact that this is a site that has been planned um, in Blueprint Denver as well as in the 20, 
uh, 12, I think, uh, Cherry Creek Area Plan um, is an area for density. And there are some, density can have its challenges, certainly, but there are some great benefits to density as well. To the extent that we can get more housing and more office space here in this location, you have the opportunity for Cherry Creek to actually be a place where people can live and work um, and where there's enough density that that can happen, that more people can park once and um, live in a place and work in that same place. So we're certainly hoping that that's something that will happen. That said, um, the traffic and the impacts that can happen with traffic are real. Um, the more you have people working and living in the same place, it's sort of a 15 minute community idea, um, the more you can avoid those kinds of things. But we are doing transportation planning, both ourselves with our consultants that we have, and then certainly coordinating with the city's uh, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure um, as we head into our next stages. Um, so you will see us really um, providing more thinking about that. Um, another mitigator as it relates to that traffic conversation is the fact that we're doing um, what in transportation solutions was mentioned earlier is called internal capture. So the idea is cars that are coming here and it is a single sort of large reservoir of shared parking that we will have. The cars that come here will come off of the street immediately and then come down into a garage that hopefully is just as thoughtful and intuitive and inviting as everything upstairs. And so people will come downstairs, both what people who live here, who work here, people who are coming to the public spaces here, and there will be great ways to move around in there. But instead of circling and potentially having traffic that's circling out on University Boulevard or out on First Avenue, and therefore just making traffic worse, they're immediately getting off of those big circulators. So we think that's important. We'll continue to work on that um, and all of those impacts that relate to that. Um, there's been also um, some questions here, um, and I'm going to just start moving through some of the concepts in general um, because there is some overlap. Um, there's been some questions about zoning. Um, and as we mentioned, we do need to rezone this site. It is what's known as B3 zoning that's under Chapter 59. It's a very technical term, but what that means is it's old zoning that doesn't exist in the code today. And um, that really essentially allows what you see today. You can have the existing buildings and the parking that surround them um, because it's, um, it's just not designed for density. And so in order to bring this up to the city's planning, um, it's going to need to be rezoned, but that is gonna be an active process that will continue to engage the community. Um, there will be more meetings like this one, as well as opportunities to engage with us um, as we start you know, getting further into this process, we'll have more things that we'll wanna put out in front of you um, for you to see things, comment on things and so on. Um, the grid question, there's a question around building layouts and grid. We did not bring the grid through for reasons that relate to that traffic conversation we were having. What's what works really well about Cherry Creek North and the way that the um, you know that's really built on that perfect grid is that there are places to go at either end of it. When you look at this site and you think about where it is placed um, within this neighborhood, um, a street that went out towards University Boulevard would dead end at Denver Country Club and another stoplight at that location would make traffic only worse. Um, so that's a right in right out intersection um, you know, or entrance to our site, um, just as the one on First Avenue is in order to really um, help to improve, um, you know, any impacts that we will have through this additional density. Similarly, if you were to head east, you would run straight into the shopping center. Um, and if you head south, you would just head into, you would come right into the creek. Um, and we don't want another connection for cars right across the creek. So um, what we really felt is if we could connect with the existing places that cars enter the site today, the Bed Bath & Beyond entrance, you might think of it as, or the Elways entrance, or off of Clayton, there's a single entrance today, um, or off of Cherry Creek Drive North, that we can really sort of manage how that traffic and all of that occurs. Um, and then um, uh, coming back to Cherry Creek Drive North, that's one, one of those entrances is actually in that place where we have buried Cherry Creek Drive North. Um, and so that is a very, very important um, entrance point still for the shopping center. Many of you who use the shopping center today, you access it using Clayton or you use it, use Cherry Creek Drive North 
all of that traffic still needs to happen. Um, but our thought was, since that's a lot of a lot of dense um, traffic that needs to go through there, and you know, loading trucks and things to uh, keep them all supplied, it's important that we really take that off of that creek edge. And so that was our idea with this landscape connection. And it's really right at grade. Um, and so there was a question, a specific question from someone I think to the south of this site, that landscape connection will be at essentially the same height as um, where the sidewalk is at Cherry Creek Drive South today. So if someone is walking across there, they're really going to be in parity of height with someone walking on the other side. And then that will mean we'll be connecting right to where the Cherry Creek uh, path is. And to allude to that next question that was asked, and again, you, you you guys are all asking really great questions that um, are all really interlinked in all of our thinking here. The, the path itself stays where it is. We are not making any changes um, to that, although certainly we would welcome an opportunity to work with the city, with the Greenway Foundation, who has a lot of interest in this, as well as other interested stakeholders in how we might think about um, how that path is working today. A lot of that is part of the Denver Moves Cherry Creek conversation and um, the kinds of things that are going to be getting um, addressed as they talk about that. What are the pinch points? What are the pain points of um, riding your bike around there, whether it's to commute or to move? Um, to move slowly. Um, there was a comment about that as a wildlife overpass. That's not really what it is, although, um, you know, certainly um, all of our green space and all of the additional trees and plantings that we're going to be doing are going to certainly make there be a lot more wildlife here. This is a connection for pedestrians that we're talking about here. And so this is really the idea is that someone could walk on foot from first in Clayton off of an improved connection there that will work with the city on there all the way down through our site, um, past the, um, the market square area, past the green space, and right down to the creek without having any steps, without having any sort of thing to, to inter, um, interfere with that issue. Um, I just mentioned the market square area. There was a question about what happens to the farmer's market. That is where we would imagine that is centered now. So today, the farmer's market is out at the corner of First University on a bunch of pavement. And so it's not, um, not maybe in as inviting of a place as some of the other farmer's markets around the city. This will mean that it'll be surrounded by areas of shade where there are trees and other shade structures. And um, the booths can kind of tuck into the buildings and along the streets and really have a nice um, streetscape there. Um, looking through here to see what other comments there were here. Um, there was a comment and a question about flooding. This has come up a couple of times. We have been doing some analysis of all of this. And interestingly, if you walk over to this site, um, the grade, the level of grade there is higher than you might imagine. And there's um, storm sewer and everything that goes underneath all of that today. Um, we believe we can do two levels of parking below there without getting into the floodplain. Certainly there are those events where, you know, big flooding can happen. And certainly we all saw some situations with, um, with I-70 just recently. So you do have those large events where things happen and we will have to plan um, for those kinds of things as we think about our planning. Um, but really our goal is to think about certainly the cars, but also how the pedestrians really can connect with that creek. Um, there was a question about building design and um, making sure that there's a distinct character to each um, of the different uh, facades, whether it's First Avenue, University Boulevard, Cherry Creek Drive, um, and I would say even more than just um, addressing each one of those individual streets separately, I think we're going to be thinking about each building very separately. Each one will have its own design exercise to make sure that each one has its own character that will avoid the concern that we have this sort of campus concept. And I think that's something that if you go down and look at what we've created in Riverfront Park and what we've created in Denver Union Station, each of those buildings has its own signature. Some of them are absolutely um, sort of big, exciting buildings with a lot to say. Others are background buildings. All of the materials are different, although sometimes relational. We'll have to think about all those kinds of things. Um, I feel like I have been talking for a long time, so I um, am thinking that I might turn this over to see if anyone else who's following the chat has something they would yeah. say I have not covered. 
Uh, Amy, I'm going to grab it from here. Um, okay. So I think at this point we should allow some folks to talk and then um, I'll be looking at some of the other questions and so that you don't have to read those as well. Um, I also just want to let people know that you know, we, we aren't going to be able to answer all of the 65 questions that we have queued up at the moment, um, but we will be providing answers to those. You'll find them an update on the cherrycreekwest.com website um, in, in the near future. Uh, some of the questions that are being asked, we don't have answers for. There's questions about what are the price range of the units, and, and there is no answer to that question. So um, at this point, let's um, we have a few people with their hands raised, and we only have one person who has just called in, but if you, the person who called in, if you want to speak, you press um, star nine. Um, and that will, in essence, raise your hand on your phone number. Um, so we're going to go in this order. Uh, first is Kurt, Kurt um, Bronk. The second is Jay Fraze. And the third is uh, Marla Felt. And uh, you will have uh, the permission to be unmuted. And so accept that. And um, we are here to... Uh, uh, hear your question or comment. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so South Creek boundary, right against the creek, the largest wall of the entire project appears to be right on the creek. Good for people who might live there and be able to look at it. Bad for anybody who has that view and or is walking on the uh, pathway, particularly the bike path side. Um, it creates, there's a 13 story building at C or at B, 11 stories at C, and even the C building is projected to pinch into the park so that it creates, again, this massive foreboding wall right on the creek. Now, of course, you can do some sort of a sloping back and so on, but honestly, the site, in my opinion, would better be better served by putting the taller buildings against First Avenue, where there's already not much walking going on. There's not gonna be a bunch of people walking down First Avenue and there's already tall buildings over there. So why wouldn't you just go ahead and, and make the stuff that was on the Creek be uh, sloping up as in lesser size in the same way that you're doing to the West. You're trying to, capture more and more views, or as many views as possible for the mountains in the same way, capture some sort of center, trying to incorporate the creek. So capture some way of having the whole project slope down to the creek in a way that that isn't foreboding when you're on the, the bikeway or just a, just a big wall. I mean, that's a 13 story wall. These are already twice the size of most of the buildings in Cherry Creek. Thank you very much for that question. You know, I will, what I will tell you is we're still thinking through um, all of the different building heights. Um, the, you know, there will be some variation in all of these. We do have one that is eight. I think our feeling had been to really spread it around and not have it be quite so literal as, um, as just a single slope, but we will definitely take that um, comment in consideration as we continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Jay. I don't know, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I was just curious whether during construction, whether uh, construction will spill over into a lane on University and a lane on First Avenue, which has happened quite a bit in Cherry Creek North. And those are very busy streets. Are you gonna be taking, you know, attention to trying not to encroach on university and uh, on lanes in university and First Avenue? That's a great question as well. 
Um, we have a lot of experience in developing in areas that are pretty tight with a lot of other um, uses nearby. So we know we need to be good neighbors um, to the extent possible. The great news is at the beginning in particular, we'll have uh, you know parts of the site that we can lay back on entirely within our own, um, our own development. But as we're working on the rest of it, we'll really need to be thoughtful about that. Um, and it's definitely a big consideration. We do um, you know, plans around thinking about how to to keep um, you know all of that minimized, so um, we'll be watch. We'll be really trying to to keep that um, as minimal as possible. Any impacts out onto the other streets, not just to closures, but also to keeping it clean and all of the other things that people care about when construction starts to happen. So definitely a consideration and a great comment. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do um, Marla, and then after that is Joshua Thomas and Catherine Dines. Hi. Uh, uh, yes. Ahead. Hello. Uh, so how many living units are we looking at? Um, so we are still in planning and not entirely sure, but on the development concept we've presented to the city so far, uh, the idea is that three of the buildings and therefore probably around 600 residences between 550 and 600 residences um, would be here as well as um, office. Other uses are also possible, um, you know, certainly hotel or, or senior housing, uh, et cetera, and then retail at the base. And, and when are we going to know what the price range that you're looking at for these units? Um, well, I think it's going to be a little while. We have not yet started uh, design of the individual buildings as we work through our entitlement process. Um, we hope to be through that um, by sometime in summer, um, maybe late summer of next year. Um, and at that point, hopefully we will have designs a little bit more, which will then start allowing us to price them. Um, but I think it's probably a year, year and a half away. And you're talking about affordable housing? Yes. Yes. In this also? Yes. yes, great question. Um, and thank you for raising that. Um, affordable housing is um, something that we plan on developing here on site. We've had some uh, very initial conversations with um, HOST, which is Housing Opportunity and uh, Stability, uh, about that. But uh, those conversations will continue as we move into our rezoning process. Is there a percentage of affordable housing in relation to the number of units? Uh, not at this time. It's something that we'll be continuing to work on as we um, engage in those conversations during rezoning. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joshua. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, I had a comment and a question. Uh, first, I, I really like the uh, connection that's being made between this development and uh, the creek. I think that that's a really interesting take. And the fact that I don't have to cross four lanes of traffic to get to and from home and recreation. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I was just curious, um, do you have an idea of how much, how many phases you might be considering to get all this, all these buildings into place? Thank you. Um, you know, right now, uh, I think we're going to try to probably develop this in three phases, which I think if if all goes well, we'll be really sort of steadily moving across the site, um, really starting on the east side first so that we can de deliver uh, the biggest elements of the public realm uh, to the community as our starting point. Um, but probably um, it's a big development and it will take some time. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you on the uh, landscape bridge. <laughs> okay, uh, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, I just wanted to say kudos to all of the team members that have put this together. I know you've all been working very hard on it. Um, I'm sort of visualizing this as a little jewel box in Denver that has been really really essential to the heart of Cherry Creek. I represent the Miller Park uh, Neighborhood Association. And I'm just curious as to telling, just making sure that the impact of the Southern side is somehow addressed in a long-term plan, if not short-term, because there's so many pedestrians that would love an opportunity to travel from Miller Park, from Belcaro, from 
Corey Merrill over to Cherry Creek. And I think that if somehow embracing the creek were to include both sides of the creek instead of just that one little edge, I think um, in the long-term plan for Denver and Cherry Creek West, that would be really something important to address. So I hope you're thinking about that. Thank you, Catherine. Um, the, um, once we cross our southern boundary, we are in Denver Parks and Recreation Territory. Um, so certainly um, part of the Denver Moves um, conversation and um, something that we can talk further about. I know there's been some planning around how that uh, creek area can be thought of. Um, won't be our decision, but we'd love to be part of the conversation for sure. Is there a way to embrace both all those entities and get them on the same page so that it's not sort of an ad hoc thing happening here and there and everywhere? Yeah, great. Uh, another great comment. Um, Denver Moves Cherry Creek is engaging um, both community members at the on the south side as well as the north side um, of our site, um, Cherry Creek North, and um, it, you know your neighborhoods over there. Um, and we are part of that conversation. Um, if you are not connected to that, certainly um, we can make a note of that and make sure that um, we get your information to. Um, the folks who are involved, Paige, who is on this call today, is um, the is leading um, much of that effort. Um, but if we're collecting all of these comments, and we can and make sure to connect you with that as well. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Um, there are uh, currently no other raised hands, um, so we can go back to the typed in questions um, in the last couple of minutes that we have. Um, there is a question about, um, would you be renaming uh, Cherry Creek North Drive and Cherry Creek South Drive? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question I hadn't thought about. Um, so I think we'll have to take that back um, and ponder that. <laughs> I think Cherry Creek Drive South might continue to make sense um, because it's south, but um, yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Um, and you already uh, talked about this a little bit, but there are several questions relating to the Cherry Creek bike path. Um, and how does your how would your plan slow down the bike traffic because uh, bikes are going 20 miles an hour and it's treacherous for pedestrians? Yeah, you know, that is, again, another question um, that relates to Denver Moves Cherry Creek. And I know from um, being engaged in those meetings that that is coming up in those conversations as well. I think that's one of the opportunities we're excited about, about the way this landscape bridge interfaces um, with the creek, is the opportunity. There are parts of that um, creek path that have sort of two lanes to it. And so there's sort of a place for fast traffic and slower traffic to, to be if it was arranged that way. Um, but it gets really narrow um, directly adjacent to our landscape bridge connection there. Um, and so there might be an opportunity for us to bring some of that slower traffic maybe a little closer to um, our um, open space and therefore give that a little bit more breathing room. The uh, path just gets a little steeper right there. Um, and so it, it's gonna be a really interesting thing to work through with the city. And we've had a lot of conversations so far, um, but more to come for sure. Um, some of these have, uh, oh, so, so we already got Kurt's comment. Um, uh, how will you interface with the Corps of Engineers who control the Cherry Creek right of way? Mm, yeah, no, great question. Um, so we are not, um, we're not proposing that we make any changes to the physical, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, the the way that the physical bank of the creek is uh, today, because again, that is um, Denver city property, not our property. Uh, to the extent that we're all working together and we ultimately were to decide there was going to be a change there, the Army Corps of Engineers would absolutely have to be engaged. Um, and I think as we continue through this plan, um, if we find ways uh, that that needs to be engaged, we will certainly um, be, be connecting with them. I know they're doing a lot of work um, downtown right now, so um, they're, they're thinking a lot about these, these watersheds. Okay. 
Um, and we do have someone uh, with their hand raised, but I'm going to uh, get another question off the typed ones. Um, this person says, uh, this is very exciting. Any idea on timeline or when this would be opening up? Great question. Um, I always forget to get into that. So um, the really the soonest we can break ground is probably third quarter of 2024, just because of the whole process of going through entitlements, as well as then as we design our other buildings, getting those through the individual building um, entitlement process um, and design process, candidly. So um, once we start that, I think the first buildings will be able to be occupied, call it five, five years from today. Um, to include sort of all of that planning and all of those things, maybe it's four years from today, um, all of the planning, the design and coming out of the ground from that parking up to the physical buildings. Um, I think we would hope that within about 10 years though, we would have all of this complete and, um, and fully realized. Um, okay, we have uh, Jeffrey uh, Kleiner um, who has his hand raised. So if you wanna unmute him. Jeffrey? Yes, thank you. Uh, the uh, uh, question that, that I had and was uh, concerned about is noise. In our neighborhood, Miller Park, there's a tremendous amount of construction which is going on, and it's really fatiguing. I'm curious as to what type of, of allowance uh, we can have uh, uh, limiting the amount of, of noise um, on uh, early mornings and on weekends while the construction is going on. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, great question. Um, I think there's sort of two pieces in that. Uh, the first is the city um, does have um, regulations around that, um, but certainly um, in certain situations, um, you know, there need to be other considerations too. So I don't know for sure what those hours are, but they'll certainly be something we need to evaluate. I know as we've done construction um, in other areas around people's homes, um, we've we've had a lot of conversations about that. So it'll be a continuing dialogue for sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, and we have uh, two more. Um, so John, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Reich, uh, and uh, Jeannie Rob. John Ricky, thank you. Ricky, I'm, sorry. I'm asking, uh, this is almost certainly not feasible, um, but have you considered building the slide out in VR? like just even a very basic massing and then walking through it at a walking pace because I know you feel like you've made it dense with a lot of stuff in here, but if you're only going three miles an hour, it you might end up getting a lot different impression uh, than the one that you're planning. Um, it feels actually like there's a lot of open space and I, I'm thinking there's probably going to be wide retail rather than lots of doors to pass by with different retailing. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's great. You know, I, we've got two incredible teams here with Design Workshop and Gensler that both have a lot of virtual capability. Um, we have been ex doing some exploration among our team in that way already. And I think as we get a little bit further into our process with the city, that's gonna be an incredible tool um, to really start sharing with the community how this feels. We're also working on um, a scale model that I think will also start to give people some perspective. Um, I know people have loved the ones we've created in the past in Riverfront and, and Union Station. And so that's another tool that'll actually probably be done a little bit sooner. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the tools that are available with technology are incredible um, and, and really should be added. And I should note, um, I'm glad to hear that um, your perspective is that there's a lot of open space here. That is by design. Um, it's really important um, that we have that, so. Okay. Oops. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jeannie Robb. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking about what CPD said about the street wall and that's, a. It's all over Cherry Creek. That's a great concept. But I am also concerned, and I'd like CPD and East West and the community to think about the setback, because if you go with one of the new zonings in our zoning code, there, there may be a build to requirement with no setback. 
And I've heard lots of concern about how close um, Restoration Hardware is to the street and across the street from this side along Sears, and yes, that may change eventually, or the old Sears, um, there is a wider sidewalk than what you see if you do a build to on First Avenue. And I'm just thinking it's such a grand avenue and also carries a lot of traffic that pedestrians like to have a little space, a little more space from the traffic to have it be proportional. So I hope people will weigh in. There might, I personally prefer Nordstrom's in a sense to restoration hardware. Um, I don't speak for the whole community, but I just like people to discuss where the street wall should land. Yeah, thank you um, for that comment. And uh, and and yes, um, <laughs> this is former councilwoman um, Jeannie Robb that is that was just speaking. To be clear, um, a big part of um, of the planning for this neighborhood and and what made uh, the area plan uh, possible, for example. Um, so yeah, I think that sh that should be a continuing conversation. We really liked that sort of movement that was provided before. Um, in our earlier um, designs, and I think um, can be a continuing dialogue as we think about how to how to make this really special. So thank you. Great. Um, so we are uh, just right up against our 90 minutes. So we're going to go over by a few minutes, um, just so that folks who are on here know that. Um, but we are starting to wrap up. Um, so we don't have any other uh, raised hands. But if you do have any other questions now would be the time to type them into the Q&A so that we receive them. And then we'll uh, talk a bit about kind of those next steps. Um, but I believe next is um, Councilman Hines. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone who uh, has come to the presentation. We had nearly 200 people um, here tonight and this will be recorded. And if these recordings are anything like um, my live streams, uh, there'll be hundreds more who, who take a look at this uh, presentation. So thank you so much for your participation, your interest in, in Cherry Creek West. And, uh, and I think it's been a vibrant discussion. So uh, thank you so much. This is, um, you know, much of this will, uh, the entire council will have to consider. And I, as the council member for, uh, for this area, will uh, we'll be guiding that discussion um, as it comes ultimately in front of council. So I wanna thank you so much for your, your thoughts, uh, your comments, and, uh, and, and I, I really expect East West Partners and Community Planning and Development to take uh, those comments and, uh, and, and help guide the, uh, the future, the next iteration of this plan. So thank you so much for attending and um, I'll hand it back. Great, thank you so much. So, um, I, Amy, I'm just going to few logistics, and then um, if you want to have some closing comments, but sure. uh, we will, as we've said, we are recording this. Um, we will be providing a link to this recording. Um, you will find that on cherrycreekwest.com. Um, and we will also be going through all of the questions that have been um, typed in tonight and providing responses to those um, you will also find that uh, in the near future on cherrycreekwest.com. Uh, and Amy, I'll uh, let you bring her home. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, um, definitely thank you uh, to everybody um, for coming and providing such thoughtful comments. Um, you really covered a lot of ground that are the kinds of things that when we spend a little bit more time we get to talk about. Um, and so um, some good things raised as well that we had not thought about. Um, we look forward to continuing that dialogue as we continue our design. To clarify a little bit about where you will find um, all of this on our website, again, it's cherrycreekwest.com, so hopefully that's easy enough. Um, there's an information and updates section, and then there's um, a community meeting section. If you go under there um, tomorrow, you should start seeing a place where you can continue to put in thoughts if you have any more um, overnight, and that's where you'll also find uh, the recording, too. So um, give us some patience while we get that all set up, um, but you should start seeing that uh, sometime tomorrow, and we look forward to the continued feedback, both for this and all of the other meetings we'll be having in the future. So thanks again for your continued engagement. Um, we really appreciate it, and thank you. Good night. Good night.